Amen. Awesome. Awesome words tonight. And um, last, I think, I think you can go up on the Glory of Zion website, and they have a, a spot called Prophecy Central. And I want you to listen to Barbara Wintrobel's word. It was about fog. And it, 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 the Lord was saying that what has happened is just a fog. And so, Carol, if you get a chance, go up. And it was from last Sunday, I believe, wasn't it? It was really a powerful word, uh, what the Lord is saying to us. So I had some um, interesting things happen to me this week. Many of you know that my dad is in a uh, full-time, long-term care facility now. But at that facility, we still have to be there. We have to be there. Sue is here tonight who takes care of him. Lillian has helped also. And we have to be with him from 10 in the morning till 8 or 9 at night because the care facilities are understaffed right now. There's many different reasons. But if, if we're not there, he's not cared for properly. And so it's just how it is. And um, because he's a, a two-person uh, he requires two people now to care for him at once. We are unable to do that really at home at the moment. So um, anyway, it's been difficult. It's been very difficult. When you go through stressful things like that, um, you know, you, things that are buried deep in you come to the surface. And, you know, we all know that. When we go through sufferings, the sufferings of Christ, this is the suffering of Christ. You know, you know what I'm saying. God permits things, and he permits these things. He, he's not blinded. He, he, didn't, he did not see all this happening. And uh, so I was in my car this week just crying out to God. I, I, I was saying to him, look, I know that you know this. You know all about this. It, it, I know that it's in your hands. We've prayed, and it wasn't shifted. We've quoted every scripture we knew. We've, we've, done, we've done all that. And yet, circumstances did not turn out as we had wished. So I said to the Lord, all right, what are you doing in me through this? What are you doing? Would you, I said, I don't know what you're trying to do. I need you to show me by revelation what it is that you're working out in me. And listen, when God's working something out in me, he's working something out in Lillian, he's working something out in Sue, my sisters, you know, my kids, our husbands. Um, this man I worked for when we worked for Benny Hinn, his name was George. He was an uh, elderly gentleman, just one of the most godly men I have ever met in my life. He had been Billy Graham's um, media head for years. He had been a missionary to China for years. I mean, this man served God. And I just loved him. He was my boss in that ministry. And he said to me one day, he said, Cheryl, he said, what you need to always remember is when someone is being tested, so are you. And they need to realize that about you. When you're being tested, so are they. And he said, the scripture is very clear that when people are going through something that is difficult that God has not removed, he said, we can't be like vultures that pick at their dying flesh. He said, we have to support in prayer. We have to ask God to cause us to be those that are um, kind and uplifting to others. And you know, sometimes it's hard when you're going through things. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're grouchy. Sometimes you're, you know, you've just, you, you're being bombarded. But that's where I was this week. And, you know, we were tired from the holiday. Well, we didn't have very much holiday, but, you know, because of everything. But it was just one of those weeks. So I asked him that in the car. Two days later, 
I went to take care of Dad. And when I got there, I, like I was there that night from 4 to 8.30. That was my shift. So when I, when I was taking care of him that night, he was, he was um, not doing well. He was up and dressed and everything, but he was um, he was hallucinating the whole time, and he was agitated, not angry, not an angry agitation, but agitated. You know, it was he he just wasn't settled. His pulse was double what it normally is, and uh, you know, I I would I, I could tell it wasn't frightening. It wasn't a fr they weren't frightening hallucinations, but they were. Um, uh, like, like difficult hallucinations, like he was trying to get things fixed and things weren't going the way he wanted and things like that, you know, where it would be for a man, it would be a diff it was a difficult thing, an anxious, it made him anxious. So I, as I sat there, I bound the tormenting spirits, you know, and we, we all know how to do that. I bound the tormenting spirits, and I commanded them to go and go back to the pit of hell that they came from. Well, he settled right down. Settled right down, pulse went back to normal, and now, I mean, he had done this for probably all day that day, right? Sue, you were there that day, too. And, um, and so um, it, things got calm, and he actually laid back and rested a little bit. Well, about two minutes later, all these people started coming to his bedroom door. All these other patients. Now we've had a patient come in once in a while by mistake. You know, we've had that happen. But they all started, these were ambulatory and they could get around in their wheelchairs and they all started coming to the door. And the Lord said to me, you wanna know what I'm working out in you? He said, I'm trying to get you to see the harvest in your midst. He said, how do you know? Now, I mean, God's speaking to me. I'm, you can feel it, can't you? He said, how do you know there's not one person here that I have called that has not yet answered? And he said, I want you to begin to be me to these people. He said, because their spirits don't have dementia. He said, their spirits do not have dementia. And when you speak my name to them, whether or not they understand it in the natural does not matter. He said, because my name has life and my name has power and my name delivers. And I, I mean, I was, I began to weep. I began to weep because he answered my prayer in two days. You know, you just don't feel like you deserve him to answer you sometimes. You know, you just feel like you've gotten in such a, you feel like that fear or that uh, anger or that whatever it is that comes at you at, at times when you really need to have a breakthrough, you feel like you've messed up. <laughs> you've messed up and you, he, you don't even deserve for him to speak to you. But he spoke to me. Some of those people speak Spanish. I got my phone out, and I asked Siri to tell me how to say Jesus loves you, or I love Jesus, do you know him? They all loved it. They were kind. They were sweet. One lady held up her crucifix and said, God of the world, she said to me. I mean, I mean, listen, and so, and so I... I just said, Lord, I've been so immersed in the trauma of what we're going through. And Mary, I know you can attest to this. You know, whenever there's, Darlene, you can attest to this right now. Many of us can attest to this. There's seasons of our life. And look what God is doing. He is opening our eyes to the harvest that we have graciously been allowed to step into the harvest field. How do we know that we are not the answer to some one of their family members' prayers? God, send someone. Send someone. Now, 
I got to thinking about Jesus. And if any of you have watched The Chosen, I'm, I'm telling you, that, that's my tribe. That's my tribe. I mean, I weep over those shows because that's how I picture Jesus. He was free. He was happy. He was not condemning. He was not religious. Listen, you can get religious in your pet doctrines that are good doctrines. Quote 10 scriptures, say this. Sometimes you just need to pray in tongues. Trisha, by the way, Trisha Roselli has just asked their whole church to get to the point where they're praying in tongues at least an hour, like Richard does anyway. But I mean, this is what this is where we're getting into. When you pray in tongues like that, revelation comes. So what do I do now? If I need to get up and, and go out of the room from where dad is, I walk up and down the aisles for my exercise, and I'm praying in tongues the whole time. I am praying in tongues. I am pleading the blood of Jesus softly under my breath. I am binding those demons that are tormenting those poor, helpless people and commanding them to go in Jesus' name. I own the atmosphere. Everywhere I put my feet belongs to me and to the Lord. And so and so this is this is how God has, I mean. I told Sue the other day, I was so excited about it because I, I just, because I had been so bogged down by it. So in, um, anyway, I, I just was thinking about Jesus. He ministered to the lepers. He ministered to the prostitutes. He ministered to the... Um, bad women. They might not have been prostitutes, but they, you know, they weren't living good lives. He ministered to the ones that had laid at the pool the longest and not gotten an answer to prayer. He, he ministered to the blind. He ministered to the lame, to the paralyzed, to the foreigner, to the children. He didn't minister to church people friends. We try to change churches. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Didn't happen for Jesus. If Jesus Christ could not change the church when he was on earth, it, we're not going to change the church structure. We have to change. We have to change. People have got to change. You're not, and I talked to Marcy one day on the phone. I said, you're not going to change, and nothing's going to change unless the higher-ups, you can't go higher than the head. And where you align yourself, that's your head. And if your head does not let women preach, zip, you ain't going to preach. If your head says, don't pray in tongues, we don't want to offend people, zip, you ain't going to pray in tongues in that church. You're not going to change it. Because we can't go higher than the head. If they don't believe that apostles are active or prophets are active today or that they can be women, zzz, it ain't going to happen in that structure. Jesus came and he literally shook the structure so that those that could receive would fall out of it and, and embrace the truth and the freedom of, of what Christ had. And the others stayed and became so brittle that in 70 AD, God destroyed Jerusalem and priestly Judaism ended. No more sacrifice. It ended. Now, there, there, was, there became after that rabbinical Judaism, which is what we have today. But it ended because the structure became so brittle he couldn't pour the new wine in it. Couldn't pour the new wine in it. You cannot pour new wine into an old wine skin. Can't do it. You cannot do it. All right, so I'm done preaching on that. But um, in John 4, verse, verses 35 through 38 and, and this is this is what I want to encourage you with because this is where we are 
even, in, even if we go through difficult times this year, which the prophets are saying, and God doesn't allow anything to happen unless he first tells the prophets. Why? So that we can hear it and be prepared spiritually, physically, and in our homes and with our families. Uh, John 4.35. Don't you have a saying, Jesus said, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Already the reaper is getting his wages. He who does the cutting now has his reward. I want to I cut some grain. I want to cut some grain in that facility. I want to cut some grain in Acme. I want to cut some grain in the post office. For he is gathering fruit unto life eternal, so that he who does the planting and he who does the reaping may rejoice together. For in this the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap a crop for which you have not toiled. Other men have labored and you have stepped in to reap the results of their work. That's us. That's us. When God sends someone across your path that needs salvation or needs healing or needs deliverance, because that's what salvation means, healing, it means being saved and forgiven, it means healed and delivered. It's all three of those things. We're reaping. We are reaping a harvest. It may, not be, it may not be getting them saved, but it may be getting them delivered or getting them to the next step. And so what are some things? How, what, what have I seen in Jesus? And I'm only going to sh share a couple things here because I don't want to be late tonight. But a couple things really stuck out to me. Um, and the, the main thing was compassion. Compassion. What the Pharisees and the religious leaders lacked in the Bible time, religious people and structures still lack today. And the number one thing is compassion. The people in your church are not your worker bees. They are, they are not your supply. They're not your servants. I mean, hear what I'm saying to you. They are the people that God has put in your care to serve, for, for you to serve them. They are the people that God has trusted you with to bring them from wherever they are in their life with him or in their physical life into the next place of their life. Whatever that takes. You, each leader, each, each church, each group who has a leader, you have been given a portion by the Lord. God builds the house. He builds the church. You've been given, you've been trusted with a portion. And if we as, as, if, as, if we as church leaders or small group leaders, whatever we are, all of us, even if you're not a leader, if we can't be kind and we can't serve one another, each job in the church is a function. My job is not any better than anybody else's. I'm held more accountable because I'm a pastor and a teacher and a prophet. I, I mean, I am held accountable, a greater accountability than if, than if that's not what you're called, to, you know, if you're called to do something else. But we are held we are held accountable one to another. We are called to serve one another. We are called to submit to one another. We are called to love one another. And like Carol said, or whoever said it, oh, um, Leslie, the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not, so you don't give a toehold to the devil. That's one of the scriptures that says a Christian can have a demon. If you go to bed with your anger, you can get a demon. Absolutely. And and the another thing is fear is is one of the I mean there's many things, but and so, you know, we've got to be people that are loving and kind to one another and 
um, forbearing. What does that mean? It means sometimes you got to put up with a little bit of stuff you don't like. And I've had, to, and the elders here can attest that are still here that haven't moved away. There's been some people that have come in that have been very difficult and trying people. I mean, they can get on your nerves. And the Lord has said, it's, it's not time yet. It's not time yet for you to, you know, you've got to work with these people a little more. As long as they're teachable, you work with them. You know, and they're like, how can, why are you letting this person get away with that? I said, I, it's, it's just where we are right now. It's, we're giving these people an opportunity to make the changes that need to be, to be done. And so I saw that with Jesus, especially in, that, in, that, in those programs of the chosen, how the disciples, it, it was, it's so exciting because you see the humanness of the yeah. disciples <laughs> fighting on their way to a meeting, fighting, you know, arguing, with, wanting to punch each other in the face, not forgiving each other. I mean, and, you know, I, you, could, you could tell it, that they did it so well in those, in those things. But, and he was gracious to Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus came to him and wept. But boy, some of those Pharisees played a good part, didn't they? But how quickly we can become a Pharisee. How quickly. I mean, I'm just saying. You know, you can't look at a person and, I don't know, I, growing up in the ministry we grew up in and, and um, taking care of the street people, the homeless, the gang members. I mean, I led murderers to the Lord. They weren't going to get, they weren't going to get arrested. That murder was long gone, and they, ran, they, they, nobody would ever know they'd done it. But they hadn't forgiven themselves. They didn't think God could forgive them, and um, He loved them. He loved them when they were committing the murder. I mean, how can you even think that? But yet he sent them in our pathway, and they got saved. Now, if you heard Linda Heidler's um, testimony about the prison, I mean, let me tell you something. That, but you know what the Lord said to me? You know, Linda and Robert Heidler went to a maximum security prison on Christmas Eve, and the death row inmates, 28 of them had come to Christ. Every morning they get up. Now, the death row inmates don't have bars on their cell. It's a closed cell with a door with a little window. That's it. But they can open and shut from the outside. And she said every morning they get up at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and worship out loud for three or four hours in this prison. Fourteen more just came to Christ. And then there's other prisoners, too. They actually have cell groups. <laughs> and many of, the, many of the prisoners have gone to seminary while in prison and have become pastors and are now the leaders over these groups. And you know what the Lord said to me when, when that, that happened to me at the, when I prayed about the, what, what he was doing in me when I was at the uh, care facility that night, he said, Cheryl, this is no different than a prison. He said, they can't even get off of this floor. He said, some of them can't even get out of bed. He said, some of them never have a visitor. He said, this too is a prison. There are many prisons. And we are blessed. What did Jesus say was true religion? Visiting those kind of people. Whatever prison they're in. And not just visiting them and taking them a little box of candy. Sitting with them. I, when I would put my hands on those people that night, I would put my hand on them and bless them. <laughs> it, are they ever touched? How, do they ever feel the, a loving touch or is it just a touch to get them and get their clothes on them and get them showered as quick as possible? I mean, you know, you all know what I'm saying. So compassion. 
Let's just ask the Lord right now. Just put your hands on your eyes. Lord, we ask you that we would see our harvest field. Lord, help us to see our harvest field. Don't let us be blinded to it. Change the way we think. Change the way we perceive. Help us, God. Darlene, you have such a harvest field in that store. Help us, God. Now, the word compassion means, I wrote it down here, feeling sympathy, pity, having an inward affection, or your bowels or emotions yearning over someone. In other words, you feel for them. You feel what they're going through. You, you perceive the trauma. You, you know, you perceive. Um, can you imagine now, my dad now, think about this. This man was very active all of his life. Up until five or six weeks ago, he was still walking a quarter mile a day, going on rides, going down to the parks and going all around with Sue and some of the other caretakers, and he, he just would love it. Now he's unable to walk. He's unable to really talk. He cannot feed himself or bathe or press a call button. That's a prison. It's a prison. Some people are imprisoned by trauma. Some people are prisoned by mental illness. They may be fine on the outside, but their mind is in prison. We have to have compassion on these people. Some of them are nasty. Some of them cuss like a sailor. Some of them try to hit you. But what, I mean, I have to say one thing that it, that it, did for me that night was made me know, made me remember why I loved nursing. Because I always had that compassion and I could be compassionate to those patients. Am I boring you all tonight? Okay. So let's turn to Matthew 9. I'm not sure which translation this is. I think it's the Amplified Classic. Ba Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, feeling sympathy, pity, and inward affection for them. His bowels yearned over them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You see, religion and dominating evil government cause you to be scattered from others. It separates people. My, my experience with religion in my life has, in my early life, when we went through things that were very difficult in religion, um, thank God I got delivered, but we had to go through it. It separated all of us, separated families. They weren't allowed to be together. People wouldn't sit next to you in church. They wouldn't even look at you in the face. That's what religion does. And what does the Lord say about a house divided? It will fall, and that, that church fell. Thank God he got us out of it. But um, then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I want you to ask the Lord this week, where are you sending me? Where is my harvest today? Where is my harvest this week? Just put your hand on your heart and your s stomach. Your, just say, Father, Father. Ignite, compassion in me. Ignite compassion in me. 
Where I have become hardened and judgmental and brittle, uncaring, thinking I'm more righteous than somebody else. And my pride, forgive me. Lord, help me to see my harvest through eyes of purity. Lord, your word says the pure in heart will see God. And if we can see you face to face, we'll see what you see. In Jesus' name. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. I hope you don't mind the scriptures, right? When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. I mean, the hunger was ignited. Why was it ignited? It wasn't just ignited because, because they were getting healed and they were getting fed and all that. It was also ignited because somebody cared. Somebody cared about them. They just didn't walk through the street with their head held high and all pompous saying, get out of the way, I'm a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Don't touch me. You'll make me unclean. I mean, they literally had Pharisees set up at places on the Sabbath so that if anybody broke the Sabbath, they'd be taken before the Pharisees and kicked out of the synagogues. Gosh, Lord, help us. Okay. And, um, and when, it, when it was evening, and Jesus went forth and saw great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy some victuals. And um, the disciples, Jesus said, They don't need to depart. You give them something to eat. And they said unto him, we only have five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them here to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. They that had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Now listen, compassion created that miracle. He healed the sick. They, he healed them. But then the compassion took him further, and the compassion multiplied the food. The compassion multiplied the goods. First it multiplied it when he gave it to the disciples. And when they gave it out, it multiplied. You get what I'm saying to you? It was a, it was a progression. And so when God births compassion, when, when you feel the yearning compassion of God on your life towards a situation, and it hits you, and you begin to move out in that compassion to, to a miracle, you, it may not even look like a miracle to you when you touch somebody. You don't know what's being done in them. It multiplies again. And there's going to be leftover for more people. You're going to collect the leftovers. You, you know, I mean, it's the kingdom currency is multiplication. It's not addition. It's not one and done. It always multiplies, and it multiplies exponentially. And, they, and, then, and then it goes on in Matthew 20. 29. I mean, I'm talking miracles here, too, because you can see how when we see the harvest, we see the reason for the miracles. We see the reason it's needed. Um, and so Matthew 20, 29, and they departed from Jericho, and a great multitude followed him. And when he saw the multitudes, remember what happened? He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, 
cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them. How quickly we can become religious. The multitude that's being healed, that's being ministered to, they rebuked the blind guys because they wanted it for themselves. I was talking to a friend this week, and she, um, she's been asking the Lord to give her a deeper, um, a deeper revelation and, and understanding and participation in the crucifixion of Christ. Because she, she was saying to me that as she reads it, it's always third party to her. She's always looking upon it, and she feels like there's a, a greater personal um, participation in that that she needs to understand and, and come into. And, and the Lord gave me the scripture. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, the capital letter I. Unless I is crucified, we're not going to see the harvest. We're not going to move with compassion because it'll be all about us. And that's what I'm talking about, about leaders. If we're called to leadership or business leadership or whatever leadership we're called to, I has to be crucified so that the, you can become the servant, the loving, compassionate. Now, does that mean you never have to correct somebody? No. It, you, do fathers correct us? Do our parents correct us? Absolutely. I, if you don't negate that, but, but tyrants are not given that right to correct us like that. A father is what? Loving, caring, compassionate, wants you to do your best, wants you to be made into the better person. And so this is, this is what's happening. So the multitude rebuked them. And it says, and Jesus, they cried out the louder, and it says, and Jesus stood still. He stood still. And he said, call them. Everybody that just said, get out of the way, he said, call them. I mean, our obedience nullifies disobedience. It neutralizes it, the scripture says. When we are obedient in whatever God tells us to do, and we take that step, and I've told this story before, a friend of mine, a friend of mine was in the airport. Flights had been canceled. Everybody was lined up. Everybody was lined up. Everybody was angry. It had been hours. And this one woman, I mean, she was not, uh, she was totally upset and aggravated and monstrous. And my friend was like two away from the airport person to change the ticket. And that woman was so bad and causing such a ruckus. And the Lord said, said to him, let her take your place and take her place in the back. And he did it. The whole atmosphere changed over that flight desk or whatever you call that. The whole atmosphere changed. But I had been crucified in him. The I, me, had been crucified. Because when you give your all to the Lord, it's not what you want any longer. It's not what you think should happen any longer. You are submitting fully to the Lord. And they said unto him, he said, what, what, do you, what will ye that I should do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. They became his followers. So I'm going to end with this. When we see our harvest in a new way and we allow the I in us to be crucified and we become the servants in that harvest, 
miracles will happen, people's lives will be touched, and many will follow him. Many will follow. Remember, it's going to be exponential. It's not just going to stop with one. It's going to multiply again and multiply again, and it'll keep multiplying. And that's what God's saying to us for the new year. We need to begin to pray in tongues more. We need to begin to shut the phone off, the TV off, and spend a quality time with the Lord in the word, praying in tongues, however, worshiping, however you do it. And let's, let's make this a year where the eye is crucified in us, where we have a brand new level of compassion in our lives for one another, where we don't look, where, where we look at one another with the attitude of how can I help you to become the better person? You know, what can I do for you in your life to bring you forward in the Lord? And I'm not saying preach and I'm, I'm just saying by our actions towards people, how can we, how can, you know, the Bible says they're going to know we're Christians by our love, not by our rules and regulations, not by our dogma, not by, you know, certain things. They're going to know by our love. And so stand up. I'm going to bless you. Bless you in this. I hope you got something out of it. I'm just preaching out of my life, my life. Sue could have probably preached the same sermon or Lillian or anybody, Darlene, anybody that's been taking care of people. I mean, and even if you're on committees and things like that, I mean, honestly, you go through a lot. You go through a lot, and God's killing the eye in you and bringing himself alive through you in a greater way. So, Lord, I bless this congregation and those that will be watching uh, on YouTube this recording. Lord, we desire that we come out of the fog, like Carol said tonight, like Barbara Wintrobel prophesied last week that we come out of the fog and we see the glory. Lord, that we see your glory resting over the harvest fields, and we know those harvest fields are the ones you're calling us to in our everyday life. Lord, we, we give ourselves to you tonight. Let's just do that. And if you don't feel like it, don't. But Lord, we recommit our lives to you tonight. Lord, we present our bodies to you tonight in this new year as a living sacrifice. Lord, we just do it again. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we have been reconciled to you. We thank you that we have boldness to enter into your presence. And, Lord, we're asking that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our feelings. Lord, let us be like you, Jesus, where the full expression of the Father full of life and full of light when you were on the earth. Let us be the full expression of you today. In Jesus' mighty, powerful name, amen. 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 amen.